Hemophilia A and B are X chromosomal recessive bleeding disorders uh, that are characterized by a deficiency of factor VIII or factor IX, and the severity of the deficiency defines the severity of the disease. Due to X-linked chromosomal inheritance, males are usually affected by the disorder and females are carriers. However, females can be affected by the deficiency of the clotting protein itself due to extreme lionization. The incidence of hemophilia A is about 1 in 8,000 males, and hemophilia B is 1 in 30,000 males. And about 400,000 patients with hemophilia have been identified in the United States so far. A third of these are new mutations, and so have no family history. Severe hemophilia refers to a deficiency of the clotting protein where you have less than 1% uh, clotting factor ability. Moderate hemophilia refers to factor levels between 1 and 5%, and mild hemophilia refers to factor levels between 50 and 30%. So the severity of the bleeding symptoms correlate or correspond with the factor levels, although the genotype and phenotype do not necessarily always correspond. However, children with hemophilia, severe hemophilia, are usually diagnosed during infancy or during the toddler stage when they begin to walk and start to develop hematomas or uh, bleeding symptoms with minor trauma and that's usually how they end up being diagnosed. Moderate and mild hemophilia, on the other hand, usually are diagnosed following trauma, resulting in bleeding or uh, hematoma formation, and sometimes after procedures or surgery that results in excessive bleeding. A lifelong increased risk of bleeding is the actual most significant complications that you see in patients with hemophilia. Uh, there is a risk for life-threatening hemorrhage in these patients. Uh, in the era of replacement products and availability, easy availability of replacement products, the development of inhibitors is actually considered to be the most major complication uh, in these patients. Uh, bleeding in these patients can occur in uh, joints as well as uh, intracranially. Um, the major sites of bleeding are defined as intracranial, neck and chest, and abdomen, because these are sites that you can't really see the bleeding occur. Um, inhibitor development is a major risk factor in these patients and uh, the management is extremely difficult in this population which makes it the most relevant complication in this day and age. The primary aim of treatment in hemophilia is to prevent bleeding and to take care of the bleeding complications once they occur. Hemophilia is a really rare bleeding disorder and the management of these patients is extremely complicated. The primary aim of our treatment in this population is to replace the product, the factor that is missing. And the aim of replacement of this factor is to ensure a level that would prevent spontaneous bleeding and to be able to manage any activity related bleeding complications. So the goal of treatment or the treatment plan typically includes establishing a good diagnosis, which means that you need to have a laboratory that is able to assess the factor level accurately in the patient. Once the severity of hemophilia has been determined, then the next step is to ensure uh, treatment appropriately. So for patients who have mild and moderate disease, most of them are placed on prophylaxis with replacement factor product. The frequency of replacement will depend on um, the need of the patient. Um, Previously, our aim was to keep factor levels above 1% in order to prevent spontaneous bleeding because that has been determined uh, from studies that if you can maintain a level above 1%, you can prevent spontaneous joint bleeding. But now, patients expect that they should be able to participate and expect a better quality of life, which means that we have to ensure levels that are not necessarily just aimed at preventing spontaneous bleeding, but also aimed at preventing activity-related bleeding. And so depending on the needs of the patient, we would have to uh, increase the frequency of factor administration, which typically is about two to three times a week, depending on whether you have a deficiency of factor eight or factor nine. In addition to replacing factor, it's also important for us to uh, ensure that there's no breakthrough bleeding and monitoring for breakthrough bleeding, reassessment of our treatment plan to ensure that there isn't excessive breakthrough bleeding. Monitoring for inhibitor formation should be part of our treatment plan in these patients. The primary driver for choosing a therapeutic regimen is the factor activity level. The more severe the deficiency, the more the frequency at which I would um, 
administer the replacement. And so patients with severe and moderate hemophilia, like I mentioned before, would probably have factor replacement that is targeted to be given two to three times a week in order to ensure or prevent spontaneous bleeding. In the developed world, uh, in this day and age, the aim is to also cater to the quality of life of our patients and also ensure normalization of their life. And in this situation, we would want them to participate in sports, play activities, go to gym class in school, in which case I need to ensure that their factor levels are appropriate at times when it's most needed. So many of these patients may choose to have a plan where they would administer factor prior to every uh, sports-related activity. So if they play basketball three times a week, they're treating three times a week. And if there's an additional game over the weekend, they would get an additional dose prior to that event. So our treatment plan is truly uh, catering to patients' needs. So it's very difficult to identify a proper treatment plan. It is individualized to the needs of the patient. The major complication related to treatment of patients with hemophilia with replacement product is the development of inhibitors. And inhibitors um, are antibodies that develop to the protein that is being replaced. And uh, the development of inhibitors is associated with excessive bleeding and major morbidity and mortality. And so looking at this as the complication related to treatment, one of the things that I have to do is to monitor for the development of inhibitors. So the, we know that the inhibitor risk is the highest in the first 100 days of treatment or first 30 exposures usually. And so if you look at it that way, that is for severe hemophilia A. And the incidence of inhibitor development for severe hemophilia A is about 30%. And whereas for hemophilia B, it's a lower incidence, somewhere between 1% and 5%. However, both of these patient populations have to be monitored for the, for the development of inhibitors. Periodically, we monitor patients who are on replacement therapy every three to four doses um, and check for the development of inhibitors. And if that is noted, then we would have to stop the replacement of, of factor and consider alternative therapies in these patients.